At first glance, the story of our Lord's passion seems to be an unmitigated disaster from beginning to end. Jesus, of course, is at the heart and center of that story. He, the only perfect one who ever lived among us. But he just seems to get caught up with the events that are going on round about us, caught up and carried along in a way that he or no human entity, for that matter, can really control. Until finally he is nothing but a lifeless hulk hanging on a cross. So it goes also in some respects for you and for me, although not to the extremes that happen to our Lord. Life happens, for good or for ill, and we just get carried along by it. In spite of our protestations, a la Charles Swinburne, that we are in control, you know, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, just isn't so, just isn't so. For good or for ill, again, things happen. We may make our plans, our determinations, we may lay out our life before us, but it seldom goes that way. As the old saying goes, if you want to make God laugh, just tell him your plans. Such a situation was similar to our psalmist. He, too, was in dire straits, and apparently through no fault of his own. The fates had dealt him a deadly blow. He finds himself at the very gates of hell, as it were. He is in misery. Listen again to what he has to say as he voices his plea to God. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. He needs help, and he needs it now, even as is also so often the case for you and for me. This psalm, written by some anonymous person, has a superscription to it if you look in your Bibles. It has a title. It's called The Prayer of a Man in in, in Affliction Who is Faint and Pours Out His Complaint to God. Eugene Peterson has translated this psalm in his translation of the Bible, his paraphrase of the Bible entitled The Message. And I'd like to share with you how he puts that inscription a prayer of one whose life is falling to pieces and who lets God know just how bad it is. As I say, fate had dealt this man a deadly blow. And if you listen to what he has to say, and let me share it with you again as Peterson puts it, I'm wasting away to nothing. I'm burning up with fever. I'm a ghost of my former self, half consumed already by terminal illness. My jaws ache from gritting my teeth. I'm nothing but skin and bones. I'm like a buzzard in the desert, a crow perched on the rubble. Insomniac, I twitter away, mournful as a sparrow in the gutter. All day long, my enemies taunt me, while others just curse. They bring in meals casseroles of ashes. I draw drink from a barrel of my tears. It sounds almost as if this man were in prison, as if he were a jailbird. Those closing words again. All day long my enemies taunt me while others just curse. They bring in meals, casseroles of ashes. I draw drink from a barrel of my tears. And the prison, if you read the rest of the psalm, it becomes rather clear. The prison was none other than Babylon, to which he and his people had been carried into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar. If you look a little further, you'll notice that Jerusalem has been destroyed, the temple leveled. And he in a foreign land, languishing there, in torment, a prisoner. 
and in misery. And as I say again, perhaps through no fault of his own, not that fate falls upon us without fault. And there was plenty of blame to go around for Israel and possibly also for this individual. You know, we suffer because of our own sins, but so often we get caught up in the sins of our, of our culture, of our community, of our world, of our nation, and we get carried along and we pay the penalty for those too. And this surely is what happened to the people of Israel, the people of Judah and Jerusalem, to be more specific. For generations, God had been calling them to repentance. For generations, he had been sending his prophets to these people, telling them to ship up or he was going to shape up or he was going to ship them out. Because you see, they had gotten caught up in worshiping the gods of their culture. And God wanted nothing better for them than for them to turn to him. And so for generations, he sends his spokesman preaching to these people, calling them to return. But they don't. They didn't. He even has his prophets warn them, if you do not turn around, if you do not come to me in repentance, then it's going to be the Egypt experience all over for you again. Then your homeland will be that home of tragedy, misery, suffering, and death that your fathers experienced for nigh on to 400 years, ages ago. Except that this time, Egypt is going to be Babylon. And so, ultimately, it happened. Judah, leveled, destroyed. Jerusalem, shattered. The temple, torn down. And God's people carried off to Babylon where this man was. And he is in, in misery. No control over what was going on, none whatsoever. And when you think of it, his situation in some respects, in many respects, is similar to ours. The people of God in Judah and Jerusalem had gotten into the habit of worshiping the false gods round about them. The false gods of their culture, the Baals, the Ashtaroths, the Moloch, Moloch, the god who had an insatiable appetite for child sacrifice, horror of horrors. And the same kind of situation exists among us today. I'm not talking about the folks out there. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about me. We have the same habit of becoming enamored with the gods of our culture and getting caught up in our worship of them. And those gods of ancient times, they have their present-day counterparts, the gods of success, of prosperity, of materialism, of sensuality. We so easily find ourselves bowing down at their altars, paying them obeisance. But it is an empty and futile life. It provides no fulfillment, no peace, no hope, no joy at all. So what can we do? What can we do? Only what the psalmist does. He turned to the Lord, poured out his heart and soul to him, and so must we also poured out his heart and soul because he knew God, although he won't let us get away with our iniquities, will not stand for our idolatries and that for our own good. Yet nevertheless, as a God who loves us with an overwhelming love, a God who reaches out with open arms to enfold us and hold us tight to himself, no matter how far we may have been away from him, he is a God who forgives and who picks us up and sets us on our way again. And so the psalmist turns to him. And so, of course, must we. That's such an integral part of our faith. 
confession and absolution, pouring our hearts out to the Lord and hearing his gracious word of forgiveness. We heard it about it again in the catechism portion that is a part of our worship this day. We pour out our hearts to the Lord, and he gives us, he brings us his forgiveness, and that at a tremendous cost. As I say, it's at the very heart and center of our faith, written up in our catechism, usually the first order of business when we come together for worship. What do we do? We confess our sins and our sinfulness. And that's important, folks. It's not just that we've done wrong or haven't done right. It's that we are wrong. Somehow we've gotten out of whack with our God. And only he can put us back together again. And that's why it's so essential to come to him regularly, every week, daily, with our prayer of confession. And, of course, the absolution that most assuredly follows It's the very heart and center of what this season is all about, Lent. And we repeat it year after year after year. Follow the story, as we heard a portion of it again this day. The story of what the Lord Jesus Christ went through for you, for me. How he was betrayed by a a very close friend. And others who were supposedly his close friends, how they forsake him and flee when push comes to shove in his life. One who even denies him. We hear of a mob that abuses him, of a crooked, crooked court that condemns him, and of a, of a judge, a governor who is so weak and, and flexible that he follows the, the calling of his enemies to have him killed, and then sentences him to die in one of the most horrible ways imaginable, crucifixion, a death reserved by the Romans only for the lowest of the lowliest people. What's that all about? Well, what's it, what it's all about is you. What it's all about is me. Our Lord went through all of this for us so that we might have his forgiveness, full and free. It's even as the Apostle Paul writes in his letter to to Timothy. This is a faithful saying and worthy of full acceptance, he says, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then he adds, of which I am chief. And you and I, knowing ourselves as we do, of course, must say the same. But the wondrous thing is that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And now, now he is enthroned forever, even as our psalmist says. He is on the top of it all. We have our ups and our downs, our highs and our lows, our valleys and our peaks. But he is enthroned forever. In our psalm, in the closing verses, it says, Long ago you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heaven are the work of your hands. They will perish, as will we, of course, but you endure. They will all wear out like a garment. You change, like, change them like clothing, and they pass away. But you are the same. And your years have no end. And the psalmist, of course, was speaking about God, our Heavenly Father. But these words appear again in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 1. And there they are applied to Jesus. He is the one who endures forever. He who was crucified for our sakes also rose again from the dead. And he lives and he reigns to all eternity. And the wondrous news is that so shall we, you and me. We too shall be enthroned forever. As our God tells us in his word, be faithful unto death 
Hang in there with me through thick and through thin, no matter what may come. Stick, stick with me, and you shall receive the crown of life. So it shall be. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.